So, Lynn, let me, let me start by asking you a question. I know, like, with your mouth full. This is what dentists do. So, how you doing? How's your life? How's your portfolio? Uh, uh. Um, I'll try to speak slowly and make my question long so you can chew and swallow. Nobody look at Lynn. She's chewing and swallowing right now. I said, don't look at her. Okay. Um, Ten years, roughly, of study on translation. What is your conclusion at this point? What do you feel like is a translation is appropriate? Based on your study, what conclusion have you come to is the translation you trust that you feel like is safe for your family? I'm just asking. This is just totally off the cuff, off the record. Although we are recording. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. That's interesting. I, I just kind of that was just for sort of commentary here. Um, so let me uh, let me. I'm going to just be very direct to start off, and then this is kind of like geometry. You give proofs and theorems, and so I'm going to just kind of I'm going to shoot it straight with y'all, and then I'm going to go through a bit of a list here. I want you to have an authorized King James version of the Bible. And I want you to use that as your primary Bible. If you're having a problem purchasing one, if that's the issue, let me know. I'll buy you one. Gene? It'll say authorized. So, King James. <laughs> um, so, good question. Um, a lot of times, so for example, this is a Schofield Study Bible. I think a, a Schofield, C.I. Schofield. Schofield was one of these guys from the turn of the uh, from the turn of the century around 1900 that published a study Bible. He was a dispensationalist, one of the early dispensationalists that sort of helped it survive into American theology. I don't agree with all of his notes. I don't recommend you get a Bible with commentary in it. Okay, we'll see why here in just a minute. But nonetheless, what you'll do is like if you come to the, the your title page, a lot of times it'll say like for example here the Holy Bible containing the Old and New Testament, authorized King James Version. Sometimes you have to kind of really dig in and find it. Does your ear say that? Well, then you're safe. Okay? Um, sometimes if you get into the minutiae there uh, in, your, in your front matter, it'll, it'll talk about you know, the 1611 version. I know Lynn just referenced that. Um, so anyway, just so you know, by the way, the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible, if you got a copy of the, the original, you couldn't read it. It is in Old English, like Gaelic, and, and the letters weren't even written the same. Okay, So for example, an S looked like an F, a U looked like a V. I mean, it was just, you, you couldn't read it, you couldn't understand it. Um, the one you have now, if you get your hands on authorized King James Version of the Bible... Um, that's as close as you're going to get to awesome. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to give you some reasons why here in just a second. I want to start with that. Um, yep. 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 Um, the other helpful resource, this is just a little side note. I'm, again, this is off the topic a little bit. A couple great resources, if you're not familiar with them yet, if you're comfortable using the internet, you can use a, a site called blueletterbible.org. Blue Letter Bible, all one word, no spaces, blueletterbible.org, O-R-G. Um, I just showed Renee that. It's an excellent resource, okay? They have an app. I actually like using the site better than the app because sometimes the functionality on the app, it'll crash on you and it gets funky. Um, and if you're on a computer, just so you know, if you ever copy and paste one of the passages from Blue Letter Bible into a document, anytime you copy and paste, it also will automatically copy and paste all your footnotes and references into your new document. I don't know if y'all knew that. And so that way it's actually an active link even in like a Word document. Side note. Um, the other is um, Webster's 1828 Dictionary. 
If you can buy one and have a physical copy, the power will never go out on it. Okay? Wind, lightning, and rain will not cause it to, to blink out. Um, the reason, I know Truman's got one, the reason why Webster's Dictionary, not Merriam Webster, that's garbage. Webster's Dictionary, 1828, the reason why that's significant is because Webster, an Englishman, um, used the Bible to create his definitions for words. And so, not only will he, will he have a definition for a word, but he will generally follow that with a, a scripture that helped him derive that meaning. That's also important because it helps you get into the mind of the early English reader of the King James. Um, you can also, I believe it's the Oxford, um, I'll have to look this up, Oxford Dictionary, but anyway, um, it's really important, but you can get on, get that free online and stuff. So just some helpful resources to you. But I, I recommend an authorized version of the King James Bible. No, um, that's a good question. No, that's actually, mine's, mine's printed in Korea, okay? Um, that's actually a great question. Generally, here's what happens. So, for example, InterVarsity Press is a big one out there. Um, you'll see that IVP on there. InterVarsity Press, I'm, I'm really cautious about, and this is why I don't want you to get one with a commentary. Let's say you get one from InterVarsity Press. It's going to have a lot of front matter on there, and then it'll also have like a plan of salvation, and it'll have a lot of back matter and concordances, and their commentary in it, and their commentary is garbage. It is not based on the rightly divided word of truth. Some of you may have gotten your hands on a Holman Christian Standard Bible that was produced by the Southern Baptist uh, denomination within the last two decades. Garbage. Okay, And it, it was produced, I think, by Thomas Nelson. Most of your new King James Bibles, by the way, are Thomas Nelson. Just going to go ahead and say it. Garbage. Is that yours? Yeah. Throw it away. Get you a King, authorized King James Version of the Bible. I'm telling you. It's going to help you out. Now listen, here's what I'm doing today. I'm, I got a bat and I'm in a china shop. Here we go. I'm re- I got my boots on. I'm ready to do some kicking. Come on. You want to fight? I'm kidding. I don't want to do that. Um, Yours is Zondervan. Zondervan's garbage. But here's the thing. I love your name. It's you are not your Bible. It's okay to kill it. Okay? You're not going to die. All right? What you need to do is get you an authorized version of the King James Bible. I don't care if it's produced by Zondervan. But if it's got all that front... Here's what I mean by front matter or what they call prolegomena. So all this stuff in the front, title, page, introduction, preface, table of contents, ignore it. Rip it out. Seriously, rip it out. Back matter. Huh? Flip it and learn. Flip it and learn. Uh, Even your maps, by the way, your maps, trust me, they are not good. They're not good. So, rip it out. I'm telling you, rip it out. Listen, hey, Gene... Gene, we're living today. We ain't in the past. So you you need to catch up. <laughs> we just keep it real, don't we? I love you, Gene. Hey y'all, I, I know I'm I know I feel like I'm slashing and dashing. Now everybody's just like, oh my goodness, Greg, what is your problem? Um let's let's keep in mind the larger context. And I do mean this seriously now because this is so important, y'all. I know a lot of times when we talk about spiritual warfare. We think it, it, it seems so ethereal and, and out in space, or it doesn't seem like it's right here in your lap. This is an issue that is literally right here in your lap. And, and that Bible that you hold in your hand, if you don't have a trust for it and don't understand what it is, I can promise you that is a huge open doorway for the devil to work in your life. Please don't let that happen. This is a safeguard. Trust me. Trust me, okay? So do yourself a favor, okay? Get you an authorized version of the King James Bible. If, you, if you're going to buy one, like let's say you're going to order online and you're just not sure, let me know. Send me a text. Take a screenshot, send it to me. Uh, if you buy one and you get it and you bring it to me, before you open it, bring it to me. I'll look at it, okay? What's that? Uh, I'll tear pages out for you. I'll, I'll, you know, redact it or whatever. That's a good idea, Gene. Claire, Claire just pointed at me like, yeah, Greg.
<laughs> and so I will. Yours says authorized. That's good. So that's fine. Uh, so here's all you need to do: all this junk up here, ignore it. But when you get to the Bible, Genesis one one, then start listening. That's all that means. Okay. So you're good. Just don't read the commentary and all the other junk. Okay. Forget the introduction. Tear the introduction out. Keep the rest of it. All right. We're on. I know, Renee. We're moving on. All right. Now, let me say this. Please research this for yourself. Please research it. Okay? Um, Because I can promise you, Lynn, you might could affirm this, but I could honestly, I, I mean, I don't have this all in my head right now, but I promise you I could stand up here and we could have a daily lesson and we could go for a solid year just on translation. You need to look into this for yourself. Be a responsible Bible owner, okay? Just like when you go to buy a car, you're going to look at the reviews, you're going to, you know, see what kind of engine it has, what kind of fuel mileage and all that stuff. I promise you the King James Version is the one. Authorized version. Not the revised standard or any of that mess, okay? All right, here's a few reasons why. And I'm going to kind of start with simple, and then we'll get a little more complex as we as we make our way down this list, if you will. So... Here's number one. Here's, here's number one reason why I want to recommend the King James Version of the Bible to you, the authorized version. Number one, you can't understand it. That is why. You cannot... I promise y'all, go back there and go back to Ezekiel. Start reading some of that stuff. And you'll be like, what? Huh? I don't know what that is. Perfect. That's right where you need to be. Because then here's what it causes you to do. Stop and think. You need to learn to stop and think about what you're reading. Now, I have taken two years on the book of Ephesians, haven't I? And we're going to have another year just on the last five verses. Why is that, Gene? I know you're ready, you heathen. Here's the reason why. I'm trying to teach. I'm joking. You're not. I'm trying to teach y'all to look at every word. You need to study every word. God did not waste His breath on one single syllable. Not one of them's misplaced. It's worth our attention. Now, just so you don't hear it from me, go to First Timothy chapter four. I do realize, by the way, this is a disclaimer. I do realize there are plenty of scholarly people out there, much more intelligent than me, much more study, blah, 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 all this stuff, that can just as easily argue that you need to have an NIV. They could argue you need an NKJV or an ESV or a CIV. I don't know. But anyway... There's plenty of you like that. I almost made Rita like blow coffee through her nose just then. Okay. So just, just trust me. I'm trying to I'm trying to lead y'all to greener pastures here, I promise you. All right. First Timothy chapter four, verse fifteen. What is the first word? Huh? You got the wrong passage then. Are you in first? Okay, and what is the first word of verse 14? I mean 15, excuse me, 15? Meditate, okay. (laughs) I knew you were. But Rita went, now, and I went, no. (laughs) Wrong one. (laughs) This is too much fun. Okay. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Look, Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, says we need to meditate. And if for no other reason, get a King James Version because you don't understand it at first sight. It will take you time to stop, think about it, study it, dig in under the surface. And as you do that, what you'll find yourself doing is meditating upon the thing. And you know what else you'll find? You'll learn it. You'll memorize it. I promise you. Um, And so... Meditate. This is such an important thing. I think it's, it's such a simple reason that all these scholarly ivory tower people tend to overlook. 
But I actually want you to be a Bible student. Okay? That's important. Really important. So, see, simple. Simple, simple reason. Here's the second one. You ready for this? It's funny because in the first point I tell you it's actually more complicated. It's a harder translation to understand. But here's point number two. It's actually a simpler and more precise translation. It's actually simpler. If you just have a few keys... Okay, now I've given you all this key before. You may not have remembered it. But here's a, here's a, a huge, important key. The King James translation, this is why I would dump the New King James translation. This is one of the reasons why. Because the New King James takes out the thee, the thou, the ye, and the you. Okay? Here's why that's significant. You as an English reader, when you are reading you, for example, the word you, Y-O-U, Okay, you do not, you all do not know whether it's singular or plural. The King James helps you with singular or plural. If it's singular, it'll be thee and thou. If it's plural, it will be ye or you. Every time. These other translations completely blind you from that. They make it all you and (laughs) y'all. So... But, but the King James actually makes it simpler and more precise. Now, I'll tell you why that's a big deal. Because eventually it's going to catch up with you in your reading of the Scripture. And when you do see it, it's like a whole new world. I mean, it's awesome. You're going to see so much more definition and color and dynamic. So, for example, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Again, thee and thou, singular. Ye and you is plural. Okay? Now watch this. This is so often overlooked, but it has huge significance for the interpretation of this passage, in my opinion. So let's look at it. First, uh, or First Corinthians chapter 3, come on down to verse 16. And the Apostle Paul says this, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Okay, I just gave you a key and I told you ye and you is always plural. Plural. Okay? That means not just one, but more than one. Okay? So in verse 16 he says, Know ye, or y'all, know y'all not that y'all... You collection of people, not just one individual, but you collection of people are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in what? Who's you? One person? Remember, ye and you are always plural. So he's talking here to the body of Christ, the collection of people. And he goes on in verse 17. Now here's where it really gets interesting to me. If any man defile the temple of God, pause. Is Paul here then telling us that if a single individual does some harm to his body, his temple, then he's got a problem? He's not saying that, is he? Because he's talking about the plural temple of God, the body of Christ. And he says in verse 70, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple... Ye, y'all, are. In context, now this is beautiful to me, if you miss the singular plural thing because you have some new translation that totally takes out the ye and the you, well then here's the point you're going to miss. When Paul talks back back there in verses 12 all the way down to 13 and 14, he's talking about those things that will survive at the judgment and be rewarded. And in context, what he's saying is those things which help to build up the body of Christ... Those are gold, silver, and precious stones because they're built upon the foundation the Apostle Paul said as the master builder. But if you do things that mess up the body of Christ, what does the Scripture say there in verse 17? Your life is going to be in shambles. It's going to be destroyed. Do you see how that little thing really brings clarity to the doctrine that Paul is trying to present? He's not talking about individuals defiling their body. He's talking about the body of Christ, the church today. And so, in my opinion, and that's just one of thousands of examples we could look. That was just the first one that kind of clicked in my mind because that made a huge difference for me. 
But the King James is actually simpler and brings clarity because it maintains the ye and the the that so many people, for whatever reason, get tripped up on. Maybe because they haven't been taught the key to that. Just remember, if you say ye or you, it's y'all. Okay? Ye or you is y'all. Ye or you is y'all. Ye or you is y'all. Thee and thou is one. Okay? Y'all with me? That's simple, right? See how simple the King James is? Really simple. All right, here's the third. This is where we start getting a little more into the weeds and technical stuff. But the King James Bible is derived from Jewish-only manuscripts. Now, remember what I told you earlier. We looked at Romans chapter 3, verses 1-3, through and it says, What advantage then hath the Jew? He says, Much in every way. Why? Chiefly because unto them was committed the oracles of God. Okay? The King James Bible is derived from manuscripts that are only Jewish manuscripts. Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. Okay? That's already a good start. Okay? I hate to break it to you if you got a new King James Version of the Bible. It is not. It is not just an improvement of the King James Bible. It is actually derived from an entirely different set of manuscripts. And we'll look at that here in just a second. Yep. So, Renee just asked, what's the difference between the New King James and the authorized version of the King James Bible? And that's a great question. Historically, one of the first differences is, is what documents were used to produce it. Okay, so that's the first. Where you're going to notice the primary difference is in what they call the readability. Okay? The New King James is more focused in its philosophy on trying to translate the thought versus just a word-for-word -word translation like the King James. And so what will happen, the, the committees that produce the New King James, as they came up on some difficult topics, for example, they would derive a translation that, was, that reads completely different than the King James. It's a, King James is what they call a wooden translation. It's very stern and hard and just word for word, whereas the New King James tends to be more fluent and, and feels a little more like how we talk. Okay? Um, another difference you'll see, for example, we just mentioned this. In the New King James, you won't get the ye and the the and the thou. Okay? They tend to pull that out and smooth it out into more common vernacular and language that we use today. So those are the primary differences you're going to see. And unless you guys get deep in this stuff, like in textual criticism and all that stuff, it, you know, you're just going to have to trust me, I guess, <laughs> unless you just really get into it. Um, but just know that the, the, to me the most important distinction is where they, the, the manuscripts that they're derived from. Okay? Um, so I'll give you an example and just... Because I've, I've had this training, okay? So I guess that's why you ought to trust me. I don't know. But, um, for example, when I took Hebrew and Greek in seminary, even the Greek Bible, for example, that was used to translate and produce the New King James New Testament is a different Greek translation than the Greek translation that was used to produce the authorized King James Version of the Bible. Two separate Greek manuscripts. Now, the Greek manuscript that is used to create the New King James and a lot of your newer translations, I can bring mine to you because I've got it. On every single page, you like let's say the page is, is this big, okay? So on every single page of that Greek New Testament, the first half is the actual Scripture. You know what the rest of it is? Now, this is the Greek text that's used to produce the new translations. The whole rest of it is what we call variants. I took weeks of study in seminary just on variants. And what it is, a variant, so you may have two manuscripts that were in, in Greek language, and they come across a word, and suddenly there's a change, there's a difference there. There's a copy error or whatever it may be. And sometimes something is either entirely omitted, you may have some additions, and many times you'll have complete spelling changes or a whole different word, and so it varies. It's a variant. And none of them agree. That's a problem. Okay? Now, the manuscripts that were used to produce the authorized version of the King James Bible, far less. Now, they all have some variants because you do have copy errors. So, for example, in the Hebrew language, and I'll just kind of make this simple as I can, the letter for R and the letter for H in the Hebrew language 
almost look identical with the exception that what's called hay in Hebrew, which is like their H, has just a small little wing on it, whereas the R has a long wing on it. But a lot of times when they were copying, they were going fast and you, wouldn't, you couldn't tell. And so that's a variant. Okay? But the manuscripts that are used to translate the authorized King James Version of the Bible, not one of them, even though you may have variants. Most of them are spelling variants. Not a single one of them have any disagreement on doctrine. Period. Tell me why that is. There, there's no variation in the Scripture itself, in the verse itself. It's, it's, it's almost 100% of the time it's just a spelling variant. So, for example, the hay and the roche. You know, one has a longer wing and one has a short wing. And so when somebody was writing it out and copying it, guess what? They, they wrote it a little long. Okay, so but tell me why that is. Why there's such consistency in one set and not the other? It's a really simple answer, and y'all read it earlier in Psalms 12. God is preserving His Word. That's really important. He's preserving His Word. So, what you have in your hand is the canon. The word canon means rule. It just means a standard, okay? So, you have the canon of Scripture here. It is the complete canon. Now, here's the thing. Throughout history, you've had various councils and meeting of, of the minds. I'll just call it that, okay? To determine what exactly is Scripture and what is not. And what has happened down through the ages, especially as theology started to bend away from Pauline doctrine and we start getting things like Roman Catholicism, you get the inclusion of a lot of documents that are not scriptural, but these guys, not by the inspiration of the Spirit, are determining what should be a part of the canon. So, for example, in the Catholic Bible, you'll get the Apocrypha, you get the Shepherd of Hermes, which is like a, a devotional book, you get First and Second Maccabees, there's a lot of other, what they consider biblical writings, but we understand they're not. That makes sense. So the canon, the canon of scripture, what you have in your hand is the Bible. That is scripture. Okay, and that again, we don't have time to get into this. Trust me. But there were there were lists of rules and regulations for what would determine what was scripture, what was the breathed word of God. And I'll be honest with y'all, it's not that mystical. So, for example, in seminary, I had to read. There's a Gospel of Mary and there's a Gospel of Thomas. Okay. In the Gospel of Thomas, right as you get down to the end of the Gospel of Thomas, which they call an extra-biblical writing, which means it's outside the Bible, or what you consider to be the canon there. So at the very end of the Gospel of Thomas, there's this passage in there that says, unless a woman literally becomes a man, she can't, he, uh, she can't be saved. So it's wackadoodle stuff. And there's no consistency with the doctrine of the rest of Scripture. You go, where do you get that from? Okay, So there's things like that that these guys, these committees, and when they're looking at these things throughout the ages past, when they looked at that, it's, it's actually pretty clear, to be honest with you. And so that's what they're doing. Questions? Thoughts? Some of y'all, this is the first time y'all have ever even thought about what Bible you're holding in. You didn't think there was any issue with it, right? It's worth looking into. Very important. All right, Emma. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's probably true. That, that's true, but that makes sense lo logically because it all rains down from one individual. You, you see what I'm saying? I mean, so uh, you could say the same for Presbyterians for the most part. You definitely could say the same for uh, Church of Christ. Um, mm -hmm. So, to give you a comparison just for the New Testament, okay? The New Testament for the King James used 57 manuscripts, okay? For your newer translation, they use 5,287. Just for the New Testament, okay? Now, what are your chances of having division and discrepancy? in 5,287 versus 57. <laughs> so that happens. 
But what has happened, so history tends to be, I, there's a glare behind you. What tends to happen through history, history ends like, it, 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 it acts like a filter of sorts. And so things condense, some things fall out. And we're going to see this here in a minute. And I, I brought an NIV, actually a TNIV, today's New International Version. And what you're going to see is that through history, especially as, as theological thought changes and evolves, because it does when you're not handling the Bible appropriately, what you see is some verses even completely drop off even though they were there. And some of that has to do with these manuscript issues. It has to do with doctrine, ultimately, because the guys couldn't determine why is that in there. And because they eventually couldn't even come to an answer, they said, uh, it sounds crazy. We'll see this. Hebrews 4.13, I think, is in particular. We'll see this in a minute. I mean, it's incredible. And it's right in front of your face. It's, this is why I say, the Bible that you hold in your hands, you need to trust it. And I would recommend a King James. Uh, and look into it. You know, you guys have been studying, uh, continue to do that. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it, ten, it tends to follow sort of streams of thought too, and you'll get consistency that way. Here is one thing that I've noticed regarding consistency and doctrine, and this, this has amazed me. I think I, I mentioned this to Truman before. When I first became a rightly divider, I was starting to put doctrine together. You know, it happened relatively quickly considering I've been a Christian for, you know, so many years and grown up in the church and all this stuff. But I also started really dividing, and, and I was on my own there just studying, right? And, and as I'm studying, I'm seeing, I was like, oh, that's what this means, that's what this means. And I start putting puzzle pieces together, and, and I'm constructing these big doctrines first in, the, in an appropriate way now because I'm rightly dividing. And then here's what started happening. I, I started looking around going, I wonder if anybody else even thinks like this. This is amazing to me. And Claire can tell you, I've gotten letters from Oregon, from England, from Canada, from Mexico, from Puerto Rico. I'm not kidding you. From Texas, all over the place. I'm not kidding you. What amazes me, I've never known these people. And when we start having conversations, guess what? We have agreement. And I mean big time agreement. How in the world does that happen? And so what, what, what you, you find you know, through time especially, is there are certain streams of thought that really coalesce and come together and people tie into those things and you get agreement. And it's, it's the same with Catholic doctrine, dispensational theology and, and different things like that. So, um, but it, it initially it originates out of these manuscripts. So that was a, I went way around the world on you there and, and, and I hope I, I got at least scratched the itch there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. That's good. All right, so, um, all right, so, the King James derived from from Jewish manuscripts. Now, there, especially in the Greek manuscripts that are primarily for the New Testament. So we're just going to talk New Testament here for a second. There were two in in the early days. So, for example, in like 30 A.D. So during Paul's lifetime, for example. You started to have two primary centers of biblical thought. Two primary cities. Okay? One was Antioch. Now, if y'all remember, where was Paul's home base? Antioch. You're smart, Gene. I knew it. I knew you knew it. Antioch. And it was it was from Antioch you started to get a lot of writings and things circulating in Christian thought. Okay? You had a lot of Jewish minds there. Then the other was Alexandria. Now, Alexandria um, was the center for intellectualism. And that's why things like Gnosticism and all these uh, uh, philosophical systems started to rise. They came out of Alexandria. Now, the reason why I bring these two up, because the, the majority of the manuscripts and the documents that were used to, to produce the translations that you can get your hands on today, they either derive from Antioch, or from Alexandria? Yes, part of it. Okay? You gotta be careful when you say Textus Receptus, because there is an Alexandrian and an Antioch, Antiochian version. Did I say that right? I don't know. But anyway, um, and so uh, here's what happened uh, you had thinkers and philosophers and theologians basically stationed at both of those cities. Now, just to kind of cut to the chase here, the King James Bible, if you trace its lineage, finds its way back to Antioch and Jewish manuscripts. Your new translations, guess what? They come from intellectualism. 
Okay, from Alexandria. Um, and so, so for example, you guys, if you've done any study, you maybe have come across uh, two guys by the name of Clement and Origen. Okay? And if you get into, for example, the Textus Receptus, you'll, you'll see a lot of references in the variants to Clement and Origen. Okay? Um, and that's because they produced Greek texts themselves. Okay? Now, here's why this is important. Alexandria, if you follow the line of thinking, eventually this is where you get the growth of Roman Catholicism. Okay, not Protestantism. Protestantism, guess where it comes out of? Gene. Antioch. Antioch. <laughs> now, you can't get any more diametrically opposed than Protestantism and Catholicism, can you? I mean, they're, they're completely different, all right? And so, uh, but this Clement guy... Um, for example, he accepted the Apocrypha as Scripture. And so as you find Bibles that are produced through that line, you're going to find that they include the Apocrypha. Okay, We do not recognize the Apocrypha as Scripture. Um, this guy, Origen, are you all ready for this? The dude did not believe in eternal punishment. Didn't believe in the lake of fire. And the reason he didn't, and this was part of the philosophies of the day, things like Gnosticism and Arianism and all this different stuff, is uh, he allegorizes the text. That means he looked at the whole thing like metaphor, and it wasn't literal. It was just kind of this story and illustration. Okay? Well, that's radically different than you and I think. Okay? Now, as you follow the streams of texts and manuscripts that come out of Alexandria and you eventually trace it down, guess what you get? I'd say this. <laughs> you get the New King James Version of the Bible. My wife has one. And so the devil has made it into our household. <laughs> Cannot believe it. Through my wife! <laughs> Samuel! <sighs> I know! But see, ultimately, isn't it supposed to be my responsibility... We're having a book burning. Hey, if y'all want to have a book burning, y'all come to the Willis house today. After baseball practice, we're having a book burning. So, um, but, but uh, I, I think it's interesting, though, in, in when you follow this. And again, I'm not getting too deep in the weeds. The NIV, the ESV, English Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New King James Version, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the list goes on and on. The, the Living Bible, the New Living Bible, the New Living Translation, the Living Translation... There's a lot of alphabet soup there, okay? Uh, if it doesn't say KJV or uh, AKJV or something to that effect, get rid of it, okay? Um, just help yourself out there. Um, so, the, uh, these new translations, eventually what happens, so it comes out of Alexandria. What time have I got? Golly! Alexandria, eventually you get two primary sets of manuscripts. One called the uh, Vaticanitis, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Vatican manuscripts. And then one's the Sinai manuscripts, Sinaiticus manuscripts. You with me? Okay. Now, and you will see these abbreviated, by the way, if you ever look at your Greek Bibles, if you get one and you look down at all the variants, they have abbreviations for these things. Okay. And so the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus manuscripts, they originated in Alexandria. Now just these two manuscripts, which account for the majority of the production of the New Testament in newer translations, disagree, are you all ready? Disagree with one another in 3,000 different places just in the Gospels. Fine's like, he's looking at me like a mule looking at a new gate. You don't mean it. This is bad. This is bad. Okay, so, I don't know about you. I don't know about where you want to invest your money. I might want to invest in a King James authorized version. Okay? Alright, so that's, that's reason number three. Here's reason number four. And this is probably all we're going to have time to, time to do. Y'all turn with me to Proverbs chapter 30 real quick. Proverbs chapter 30. I really want to try to get into a couple comparisons real quick too in just a second. Yeah, you got to count. Yeah, she's bitter now. Proverbs chapter 30.
I'm on is page 694. The page numbers, by the way, are not inspired, so I can't really help you. It's not going to be consistent. See, there's disagreement. What's that? None of the numbers. Are... Hey, in fact, if you go to the book of Psalms, the heading of each psalm, you know, it's always in italics up there. That's actually verse 1 in the Hebrew Bible. And everything. That is the inspired title on the first part. So if you go to a Hebrew Bible, you look at verse 1, then you try to compare it with verse 1 in your English Bible, you realize, like, these aren't saying anything the same. So you got to be careful. Uh, all right, Proverbs 30, look at verse 5. It says, every word of God is pure. Hey, we've seen that before. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So what is the Word telling us here? Do not add to His inspired words. Do not add to it. Alright, with that in mind, the Greek, and I'm just talking here the Greek, so this is just New Testament, okay? Okay. The Greek manuscripts from which the new translations are derived, that Vaticanitis and Sinai, those, those issues, okay, sound like medical conditions. They add 306 words. They omit 2,987 words, and they delete, are you ready, 20 verses. This is just in the New Testament. Okay? So, for example, y'all turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. While y'all are doing that in your King James Bible, y'all, by the way, so I bought this Bible way back, and then I gave it to Seth. Can y'all tell? <laughs> it's about destroyed, Seth. I don't know what you did to this Bible. If, if I know, it just... No, that's not true. Look, he was reading that thing. He was wearing it out. Matthew chapter 17. Uh, I can't see. I can't find it in this old piece of garbage. All right. Somebody read for me Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. Out of the King James Bible. Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. Michael, you got it? You don't? <laughs> yeah, you have to redo it. You got it back there? Read it for me. Matthew 17, verse 21. Michael, read it again in your Bible. Hey, now watch this. New International Version. Deleted. Not there. You got the comparison, don't you? You got the side by side. <gasps> you thought I was lying to you. Caught you. It's not the only one. Y'all, we could go for days on this. Go to Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. Aren't you glad you got the King James side now? Matthew chapter 23. Now, what will happen sometimes, so for example... You can tell the translators kind of get convicted. Um, and so, for example, what they'll do in the TNIV, they'll put one of these omitted verses, just a number, in brackets. And it kind of causes you to go, hmm, but they don't explain why. And it's not until you do a comparative study like what we're just doing, a simple one right here, you realize, oh, it's because they omitted that one and they're just giving a little placeholder. Hey, there used to be a verse here. <laughs> because it wasn't in the original manuscripts. Yeah. yeah. So that was my second point there, Lynn. The other reason why it's either not in the manuscripts or, for example, you get so many variants and so much conflict on that, they omit it. There's an entire chapter, um, I want to say, I might be lying here, the end of Mark, Mark chapter 16. Some of your translations, the entire thing is in italics. And the reason is, is because that whole section is a variant section in those manuscripts that those translations are derived from. You get to King James, they don't woe up. It's all there. It's the inspired Word of God. And when you learn to rightly divide, you understand, hey, the doctrine makes sense. I don't have to cut it out. So cut it out!
out, people. Kid. Uh, all right, where are we at? Matthew 23. Uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 23. Go to verse 14. You got it? Read it for me. NIV. Is it there? It's not there, is it? I'm, I'm pointing at um, Trevor. Uh, sorry, I got so much junk going through my brain right now. I'm pointing at Trevor because Trevor has what they call a parallel version. So on one column he has the King James, and on the other column he has the NIV. And the reason why they do that is so you can do comparative study, like with what you're doing there. And so it's really easy to see that comparison there. Y'all, I'm telling you, we go for days on end on this and study this stuff. And it just, it is what it is. Um, for my money, Proverbs tells me not to add to. And then we know that also means don't take away, don't change the thing. Apparently, somebody is corrupting the Word of God. Now, let's back up, look big picture again. We're talking about spiritual warfare. The devil is counterfeiting the Word. Some of you are holding a counterfeit translation in your hands. <coughs> Claire. <laughs> Samuel. Uh, and so, we've got to do something about it. Now, um, most of these changes that we're... T- ah, four minutes. Four minutes. Most of these, these discrepancies that we're seeing here, for example, when a verse is omitted and a verse, there's some words added or there's some words omitted from it, what happens, y'all got to understand, human beings, when they decide to produce their own Bible, they're human beings. And they have a persuasion of thought. What that means is they have a particular way of thinking about God, a way of thinking about salvation, a way of thinking about the church. They have this whole system in their head. And so then when they approach the text, they look at it through that lens. And if what they are reading does not agree with what they're viewing through that lens, guess what they do? They change it. (laughs) Okay? Now, if you do some study and you go back previous to these newer translations, you find what's called the Westcott-Hort translation of the Bible. Okay? These two dudes, Westcott and Hort, okay, they are not your friend. Okay? Just to give you a brief biography of these two, um, Westcott, he did not accept Genesis 1 through 3. Rita, he's definitely not your friend because that's one of your favorite. That's your favorite part of the whole Bible right there. Genesis 1 through 3. Didn't, didn't accept the creation. He has a theology he's viewing this thing through. So you can imagine when he produces a text, it's going to be persuaded by that system of thought. He didn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. Yeah, I want one of those Bibles. No! Um... He didn't believe in miracles, and he did not believe in the literal coming of Christ. Hort, the other dude, so Westcott and Hort, Hort didn't accept the infallibility of Scripture. In other words, it's it's, it's, uh, lack of error. Uh, He did not, uh, and this is a big part of his thought, and this was common coming through their period of history. He accepted wholeheartedly Darwin's theory of evolution. So it makes sense when him and Westcott get together and, and, and then they reject Genesis 1 through 3. Well, based on what? Based on their evolutionary theory. It doesn't jihad with their philosophy, so they cut it out. Do you all see the problems here? These are significant problems. Um, go with me now to... Let me put this thing down. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, again, you've got to remember this. In Paul's day, the devil was at play just as much as he is today. We're, it, it has just gotten such a variety at this point in time, 2,000 years later. But it was certainly the same in Paul's day. Now, look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. 
Paul says, For we are not as many which do what? Which corrupt the Word of God. Now, a lot of times we read passages like that and say, Oh yeah, that was back then. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Caleb, I can't believe you work for Lifeway. You corrupted individual. I'm kidding. Hey, listen. People, I'm totally teasing, Lynn, I'm totally teasing him. Don't, don't be, I, I know he's your boy. <laughs> I know, praise the Lord, right? Okay, so, hey, listen, y'all, I promise you this, today, right now, there are committees of men that are meeting to produce a new translation of the Bible. I promise you that, okay? And you know what people are doing when they are doing that. They are corrupting the Word of God. This passage here is just as pertinent to you and I today as it was 2,000 years ago. The same spiritual war that was going on there is going on here, right now. And the proof's in the pudding. We've been looking at some of it, okay?